Welcome everyone, and we are studying Bang on Time. I'm Dani Miral, and I'm working with the CLU and uh, oh, the University of Kassel, and that's a little bit complicated, but I will try and make it clear for everyone. Uh, the Global Labour University. <laughs> um, the Global Labour University is a network of universities across the world, and Praveen uh, has joined us from India, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University, where he is a professor of economics at the Economic Studies and Planning Department, and also the founder and chair, and currently professor at the Center for Informal Welfare and Labour. Um, he's been coming to Germany, I think, for the past 25 years or so as a visiting lecturer, visiting professor, but particularly Kassel for, for the last at least 15 years, I think. Uh, first, as part of the ICDD, the Informal Center for Development and Recent Work, which has now been uh, subsumed under the Kassel Institute of Sustainability under the university. Uh, where it continues as a working group and will have hopefully many projects, of which this is the first to set the stage. Um, I will now soon pass the floor to Lisa, but before that, I want to let everyone here know that the event is being live streamed. So there is a chance that you might appear on camera. However, if you don't consent to this, please let us know, and there are ways of preventing that. Um, I mean, you can raise your hands if you don't want to be on camera. Okay, I guess everyone wants to be a star. <laughs> um, for our online participants, um, also welcome. And please feel free to participate by putting your questions into the chat. And uh, I can then ask Raveen to address them. Lisa? Yeah, thank you for the organizing team to set up this event. This is uh, having an online stream and uh, present uh, event with people being present in the room. It's a lot of organizational things to do. I have the honor to welcome um, Pravinda and to say a few words about um, the content of your presentation, giving you the welcome. When you wrote you wanted to talk about global exploitation chains, I was thrilled because it echoes, of course, the long tradition of work on global value chains, global production networks, global commodity chains, chains which also has a long tradition at the ICDD, especially with view to, um, to agricultural production. And um, I am on my side myself, there are many different ways of naming these chains. I'm um, myself uh, part of the Team Global Production Network, and I like um, that approach very much because it allows us to see certain things. Whatever we call it, I think in the debate, it is very clear that there are two different kinds of research done on that. One of them very much business-centered, understanding development as a way to find ways how to improve the performance of businesses and thereby also reach social and economic upgrading. And the other strand of the debate is those who try to better understand how capitalism works and what the role of these um, uh, actors are in capitalism. And I'm very happy that we are here with somebody from the second strand of the debate because this allows us to critically discuss current developments in, in um, capitalism. So um, it does not only make visible how value is created or exploitation is taking place, but it also allows us to theorize on how power and state works in a capitalist economy um, and the capital labor relation, but also everything that is perceived as external from this relation. So social reproduction, subsistence economy, small scale agriculture, in relation to how value is created and distributed along the world and what this means for North-South relations. So I think we have a topic and a speaker who very much helps us to understand development, not in the way of understanding how business performs better, but development in a political way and in a human rights-centered way. So this is why I'm very happy to have you here and I would give you the floor for a presentation of about 40 minutes and we will have time for discussion and, and um, critical thinking afterwards. Okay. 
No, no, if you want to show, yeah. I mean, you, you tell me. Okay, all right. So let me, first of all, uh, express my gratitude to the hosts, Lisa in particular, but her entire team, all the colleagues here in, in, in Kassel uh, who are part of different networks, GPN, GLU, et cetera, for facilitating this conversation. Uh, as I see it, uh, this is one of the most important aspects of contemporary capitalism. And we'll talk about that in somewhat greater detail as, as I go along. I've been working on uh, these issues for well over a decade. Uh, a lot of my work has been with uh, colleagues from three different continents, Asia, Africa, and Latin America. Uh, a lot of it has been with Paris Yoris. Sort of earlier, it used to be Sam Moyo, Paris Yoris, myself, and so on. More recently, there are many others who have become uh, colleagues uh, who have been part of this uh, overall sort of uh, knowledge, uh, engagement, production, etc. Uh, with respect to this particular theme, including many of my students like uh, uh, Meghana and Preksha here. So uh, as, as we know that any production is not an individual task. All production is social, and this is equally important, if not even more so for knowledge production. We always sort of connect with all those who have been working on these issues for decades, centuries, and so on and so forth, and many others who are our contemporaries. Okay, so with that uh, uh, expression of my gratitude, let me move on with the, the theme that uh, I want to discuss here. As you see, the title is uh, Global Exploitation Chains. I have some 15 odd papers pertaining to this particular area and a couple of books uh, in which I also discuss these things. In fact, this particular title is uh, something which uh, comes from Christoph Scherer. You know, he did a handbook and he said, why don't you title your paper? And he asked me to write a paper. Why don't you title it as a Global Exploitation Chains? I said, perfectly fine. Okay, so what are we doing here? Essentially, <clears throat> uh, sort of, uh, I give you a broad framework. In fact, what uh, uh, is very common in terms of, uh, uh, let's say, lots of buzz phrases, supply chain, commodity chain, and so on and so forth. My preferred thing has been uh, global value systems. Okay, uh, for a while when I started working, I used to use global production networks. But very soon I realized that this is inadequate. Right? Uh, I'll probably try and explain that very briefly. And uh, we look at what the situation is at the current juncture, in particular implications for agriculture. And then I have some concluding uh, remarks, very brief remarks and so on. Now, if you are looking at contemporary capitalism, there are a few markers which I consider to be extremely important I mean, there are many other markers, but these, which I highlight here from the point of view of uh, what we are discussing today. Yeah, so there was a very significant shift from uh, kind of regulated capitalism, dirigism, and um, to neoliberalism, starts in 1970s. Yeah. Gradual kind of shift starts from 60s itself, but 70s by uh, sort of, let's say 1980s, yeah, by the end of that decade, we noticed that there is a very significant shift. When we talk of regulated capitalism, we can also take into account another system which was part of roughly, let's say, one third of the globe, a kind of model of command socialism by and large, which was regulating economic activities and so on. So in a sense, in a, in a, in a metaphorical sense, I often, uh, I use a phrase, a transition from the Bandung movement to the Berlin movement. And the Berlin movement is the collapse of the wall and so on and so forth. And by then, you know, the ascendancy and hegemony of uh, neoliberal capitalism was very, very clear. Right? Okay, so that shift and something which is extremely important as uh, we see it, uh, you know, if we look at capital in its different or as its different fractions. There are many things that we can talk about, 
but broadly, you know, sort of we can think in terms of capital as finance and capital in production. Right? Now, the way I understand it, during the last roughly half a century or so, you know, capital as finance, which used to be kind of a junior partner okay, to capital in production, we find that that has become the most important economic actor. And we don't have time to give you the numbers, etc. But if you're interested, uh, subsequently, we can talk about um, sort of some operational measures to uh, discuss that. And what has this done to North-South relation? Uh, another very important feature. So, you know, apart from ascendancy of capital as finance, the other very important feature that we need to keep in mind is, which again is very significant, very novel, decentering of production from global north to global south. Yeah, uh, select destinations, not everywhere. Africa has been by and large bypassed, yeah, barring one or two countries. But you know, there is this kind of decentering of production. All the sort of uh, frontier areas, which was very much the domain in terms of production, domain of the North, many of these actually have uh, shifted. Now, of course, it's the shifting of the tasks, not the lock, stock and barrel kind of shift that we need to understand. Uh, most important components there remain very much within the headquarters. Right? So this decentering itself has a particular nature, character, etc. All this has uh, deepened inequalities between North and South. And uh, as it happens, uh, we need to contextualize what is happening to agriculture within this overall macroeconomic landscape. Right? So that is, okay. <clears throat> so coming specifically to agriculture, we know that lots of things have happened uh, post Second World War, production has tri you know, tripled largely through green revolution packages. It has had uh, some sort of uh, positives, but a whole lot of negatives as well that we need to talk about. Yeah. Uh, nonetheless, this has been very uneven. We know that roughly uh, anywhere between 800 to 9, 900 million, you know, according to if you look at last roughly two decades or so, estimates tell you that around that they remain uh, chronically hungry. And this is the worst kind of uh, definition of food security when we talk of chronic hunger. Right? If you look at uh, all other relatively more sophisticated kind of definitions of uh, food insecurity, we can sort of uh, take it that anywhere between 2.3 to 2.7 billion. Yeah, sort of you start thinking in terms of proper nutrition, balanced diet, and so on and so forth. So we are not talking any any of that, but uh, and all this has uh, sort of happened in a context of the growing penetration of the transnational corporations within uh, agriculture. Uh, adverse incorporation of agriculture of the global south has indeed massively increase the value capture by transnational corporations. Again, we have a lot of data. We can talk about those, right? And uh, you know, this is what we were talking about earlier, that these different phrases and so on, which, uh, which have been part of uh, the discourse. Right? Incidentally, in the contemporary sort of uh, uh, discourses, it was uh, Emmanuel Wolderstein who first used this uh, expression, global commodity chains, which was taken over by the management schools Jerefi in particular, who is kind of, you know, what I could call the managerialist perspective, yeah, or business perspective that uh, Lisa uh, mentioned, yeah. So Jerefi kind of then runs away with it and becomes a superstar and so on and so forth, and he is leader of that particular group in a sense. Right? Whereas within the political economy discourses, you know, we, we, we have had uh, lots of uh, uh, work for a very long time, and I'll come to that in a minute, but these... Uh, instruments of value capture have been uh, described, mapped, et cetera. You know, many of these uh, processes have been captured even in that literature. I'm not saying that it's completely useless or anything like that, but uh, remains inadequate for reasons that I'll come to in a minute. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, all right. So, you know, the structural kind of uh, features or the systemic features is what really remains largely absent from all these managerialist kind of perspectives and so on. Uh, as Lisa mentioned, uh, the state and the different kinds of things that we need to uh, talk about, and also the conception of production and capture of value remains quite limited in most of these discourses. Uh, 
So I prefer to use this global value system, very simple reason that uh, right since the inception of capitalism, I mean, there is an understanding within the political economy approaches, in particular the Maxim political economy tradition, that uh, we have a combined and global sort of uneven capitalism, right? Where every part of the world, you know, gradually becomes integrated into it. In fact, to use uh, Max's phrase, no Chinese wall is intact and safe. Right? Everything will be hammered and brought into you know, this combined and uneven kind of story and so on. Uh, sort of, uh, so in that sense, there has been implicit or explicit usage of this global connectedness as being central to the global value system in terms of generation and appropriation, right? So both Paris and I, we felt very strongly that, you know, this is possibly a much better way of connecting with that literature, right? And then we come to the contemporary global value system. So as all of us know, as capitalism evolves, it goes through multiple phases and each phase has its own specificity, its own characteristics and so on and so forth, right? So for to describe the contemporary global value system, we use a very simple uh, kind of definition that uh, we are talking about uh, a restructured global economic system, world economy, where components of a single end use commodity, final output are conceived, designed, produced, procured, and processed in different parts of the globe before being assembled together at a specific destination for ultimate consumption, which again may have a global reach. So that's the kind of, if you want some operational simple definition of it, of the contemporary global value system, which has a number of features that I mentioned right at the outset, you know, markers of contemporary capitalism. Now, those have to be kind of directly and explicitly brought into the conversation there. Right, so this uh, framework helps us um, understand the embeddedness of uh, restructured and decentered production systems and how that is getting transformed structurally and otherwise in multiple ways, patterns of vertical and horizontal integration and so on, right? uh, structural power of different economic actors who are within the production um, and even those who are outside this production network. In fact, some of the most powerful actors today, yeah, remain outside the production network. So, you know, that's why, uh, Lisa, to get back to what uh, your preferred expression is, the global production network, I feel it, or rather we feel that it remains quite inadequate because it still is focusing on the production, the boundaries of production, the domain of production, right? So, uh, I mean, of course, if you want to, instead of production, if you want to use value networks, that probably would be slightly preferable, right? But, uh, Okay, so, all right, so coming to the value system, a very brief kind of uh, history of it, you know, in our understanding, we're completely convinced that in fact, capitalism came into being along with this global connectedness. Without that, it wouldn't have happened, right? In fact, rise of the North is indeed premised on uh, exactly that kind of connectedness which was uh, loot, plunder, and so on and so forth, what Marx had uh, described as the rosy dawn of primitive accumulation. And so he, he talks of a few features, highlights a few things, saying that, but for this, you know, this primitive accumulation, which is associated with the genesis of capitalism, that itself wouldn't have materialized. Right? You know, OECD had commissioned Angus Madison to sort of... Uh, look at the economic history of uh, the recent times, particularly capitalism. And in fact, it was commissioned for about a thousand years. And he, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's one of the most authoritative kind of accounts. And if you look at, let's say, 1750, middle of 18th century or so, right? Apart from the you know, so-called contemporary global south, which were way, 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 way ahead in terms of agriculture. But what most people do not appreciate and know that they were fantastically ahead in terms of non-agriculture as, as well. So if you look at only two countries, China and India accounted for roughly about 55% of non-agricultural production of the world. And if you take a few other countries, we are talking of close to 90% or so. This is middle of the 18th century. Right? What happens by middle of the 20th century? Complete inversion, completely gone. You know, China and India, they're about two to 3% or so. Right? So I think uh, 
this this whole long duty has to be understood and you know this this global value system which was structured in particular ways all that needs to be so what we are saying is that um, you know this this uh, this is nothing new in fact it brings capitalism into being and from the different stages of capitalism have been there so so called supply chains and uh, you know value chains and commodity chains there's nothing new about it it's just that they assume very different characteristics different uh, forms at uh, during different stages etc right so if you look at yeah, i mean i don't have time to get into lots of details uh, but triangular trade arrangements which had played a major part you no know, sort of in uh, impoverishment of africa yeah uh, likewise if you look at let's say uh, britain and china and india i mean what happens is really bizarre i mean chinese were not into opium yeah opium gets produced in india so that chinese can be paid for for their all the fantastic uh, silverware and all kinds of things right so both of these countries china and india sort of sort of basically end up you know like uh, caliban yeah in tempest yeah uh, the emperor yeah the emperor being the britain the great britain i mean this is this is bizarre this is forced commercialization which played a major role similar things happen in uh, you know uh, sort of transatlantic kind of trade patterns and so on okay let me so the early phase it was dramatic and very explicit very visible drain of wealth and so on yeah a straight forward expropriation and etc right what has happened subsequently is that 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 that, that uh, has changed significantly and especially after these countries uh, gained the freedom from the sort of you know political colonialism right uh, they have never succeeded in getting independence from economic colonialism right so kwame nkrumah he way back in 1957 yeah uh, used a phrase called neo colonialism right and basically saying that you know all the sort of processes within the boundaries of the domestic entity in a particular country and so on are actually influenced massively by external forces and external powers and so on so on. right so okay uh so as i said that you have within the maxian discourse uh, a very profound understanding of it and not only maxist discourse but many other traditions in political economy do engage with these things whereas at best you have the likes of balvin and elmson low and so on within the mainstream or what i have described as the managerial perspective and so on who talk of global interdependencies right and say that yeah no no these inter interdependencies are not entirely new there's some history to it and so on so on, right and uh, yes uh, you have lots of very profound uh, scholars in the global south who have done you know, humongous work right so i just mention a couple of them here okay the current juncture how much time do we have oh, yeah, okay fine uh okay so you know within the Marx's discourse in particular yeah something which got highlighted uh, i think uh, this was uh, you know if if you, if you look at uh, what uh, uh, lenin in the foreword to bukharin's fantastic book hmm? yeah uh, 1913 okay so he sort of uh, writes the preface of it and uh, i can quickly find it because we don't have too much time then i'll read it out to you yes this is lenin 1913 uh, it is highly important to have in mind that this change has caused by nothing but the direct development growth continuation of the deep seated and fundamental tendencies of capitalism imminent tendencies of capitalism this is how in the marxist discourse you talk of these things and, and production of commodities in general the growth of commodity exchange the growth of large scale production are fundamental tendencies observable for centuries throughout the whole world at a certain stage in the development of exchange at a certain stage in the growth of large scale production namely at the stage that was reached approximately at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th centuries commodity exchange had created such an internationalization of economic relations and such an 
uh, internationalization of capital accompanied by a vast increase in large scale production and free competition began to be replaced by monopoly. Right? So this current phase of you know, what I have called uh, global connectedness needs to be traced from there and many features and so on and so forth. Uh, the typical ruler of the world became finance capital. This is Lenin in 1913, right? A power that is peculiarly mobile and flexible, peculiarly intertwined at home and internationally, peculiarly devoid of individuality and divorced from the immediate process of production, peculiarly easy to concentrate, a power that has already made peculiarly large strides on the road to, of concentration, so that literally several hundred billionaires and millionaires hold in their hands the fate of the whole world. Right? So this is, as I said, okay, so let's move on. So decentering that we talked about from core to the periphery. Now it has uh, essentially used finance uh, and technology in particular ways. Yeah, uh, as it happens, you know, there was no mobility of capital till this particular phase, except in those areas which were colonies of settlement. From everywhere else, capital was being taken away. You know, surplus was being sort of taken away and so on and so forth. So this is a very novel feature, right? But essentially what has happened is that from 1970s, as I said, with the advent of neoliberalism in particular, you know, you have some shift yeah, of capital from north to south. You know, I often give the example of Detroit, which was considered to be the auto capital of the world, right? In two decades, it becomes a rust belt. Everything has gone, everything is shifted, right? So why has that happened and so on and so forth? So we'll come to that very quickly. But the other very powerful mechanism is not to shift any capital, not to give any foreign direct investment, but simply use you know, domestic producers. And that is what the adverse incorporation that we were talking about uh, happens to be, right? So, uh, you know, this whole business of suppliers and buyers. Yeah? So incorporation of existing production into the global value system. That is another very important and new phase that we need to talk about. Okay, so, you know, many of you would have heard this expression by Stephen Roach, yeah? Global labor arbitrage or wage arbitrage, right? Now, of course, that plays an important role, but uh, for uh, us, it is actually uh, what we call global labor, nature, and regulation arbitrage. Right? So it's not only the cost differences in terms of wages, right, which is critical, but nature, you know, I think uh, large uh, parts of Europe, for instance, you know, uh, continental Europe, uh, in fact, stopped producing uh, sort of uh, garments, etc. long ago. Yeah, why? Because it was considered one of the most polluting sectors. Right? You then shift it entirely to the south or you know, get it from there so that nature has no, no value there, right? Uh, okay, if we have time, I'll tell you many interesting stories there. Let me come to agriculture very quickly because I'm running, off time, running out of time, yeah? So deepening of corporate concentration, compression of uh, public investment, all this combines, connects very well with neoliberalism. Um, accelerated increase in private equity funds. This is an extremely important feature of the contemporary uh, neoliberal capitalism. In fact, two days ago, I was uh, at this Regulating Decent Work conference where somebody was presenting something on uh, the US, right? And uh, she mentioned uh, sort of uh, in, 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 a, in a presentation that the global GDP currently is 140 trillion, right? Of which, Private equity accounts for 15%. They are completely unregulated. Nobody knows what they are doing and so on. That's why I sort of of global value system and not production system. Right? They're completely outside that. Yeah, and they can mess up with the. So, for instance, if you look at uh, uh, you know uh, black uh, no, Blackstone, the current worth of Blackstone is uh, 914 uh, billion USD, right? Soon it will be a trillion or so, right? Yeah. And it 
it has been found by researchers that it already is connected with 479 companies right yeah and you can't do a thing yeah, sort of uh, likewise carlyle capital and so on so those are some of these so what 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 happened here as i mentioned between 2004 and 2019 you know these equities zoomed from 7 in 2004 to 300 in 2019 yeah and um, a huge amount of uh, sort of investment these investments are in agriculture right so let's just okay of about 300 private equity funds operating globally close to 200 focus directly on acquisition of acquisition or operation of farm land right uh, along with other agribusiness related activities very well entrenched and so on land matrix database tells you that 4 to 11 anywhere between that uh, Uh, range 4 to 11 million hectares of land was snapped annually by global foreign investors a figure which surpasses land grabs towards the end of the 19th century at the height of colonialism right so you know it's it's, it's that kind of uh, concentration of wealth in tncs has of course increased their structural institutional and discursive power sort of we we need to look at all these multiple dimensions of power and so on reflected in all kinds of markets inputs retail processing and so on research and development activities yeah uh, increasingly it is being relied upon on tncs because states everywhere are basically either be, they have become in terms of these activities and areas become very weak and so on so okay lateral alliances with big domestic businesses and mergers and acquisitions help in expanding and developing contemporary global agricultural value networks yeah all of you know abcd yeah sort of uh, adm bunge kargil and louis dreyfus or the so called abcds uh, grain giants estimated to dominate roughly 70% of the grain trade and have made several inroads into agricultural industrial system bear kem china syngenta dow dupont their combined market share uh is uh, currently estimated as 70 to 90% these four corporations right my hand a handful of corporations are major players in food processing retailing services company nestle unilever walmart tesco kfo mcdonalds kfc yeah okay workers everywhere and peasantry is being completely rogered completely rogered right whether you look at latin america africa uh, asia and so on and so forth right um of course it's not the case that the peasantry is entirely immune uh, even in the north yeah but then the kind of support system which is provided to them yeah so in the us for instance you know if you look at the suicide among the general population and among the peasantry it's almost twice as high so everyone knows about suicides in india but it's not only india specific that story i think we need to okay yes uh, you know average compensation in agriculture incidentally megna had done this table for me so <laughs> okay so you can sort of see what is happening this fraction of uh, brazil china india indonesia mexico and so on um, again basically you are looking at hourly compensation which is in the range of almost zero yeah in a comparative sense to about 20% or so right okay let me not give you basically the data essentially tells us that early com- compensation per worker is uh, uh, much lower in the global south and it has remained uh, kind of at low levels very low levels again please do not forget that situation for workers in the north also is not that great so joseph stiglitz tells you that for almost since the end of 1960s the most recent uh, period for which the data is available The real wages of american workers have remained stagnant yeah so okay all right so ascendancy of corporate power in agri businesses and food systems in the recent decades is historically unprecedented yeah we have all the data to demonstrate and support this conclusion and the tncs mostly headquartered in the north are in commanding position and they are becoming the rulers and masters of the world extreme asymmetries in economic power between north and south backed by current rules of the game 
you know, which is where all these institutions, Bretton Woods institutions and so on, World Bank and so on, et cetera, et cetera. But there's a great deal outside that, beyond that, yeah, it's taking a heavy toll on presence and agricultural workers in relatively unfashionable strands of literature that I belong to. It is still known as imperialism or neocolonialism, right? In fact, for me, there's nothing called, in an economic sense, post-colonial, right? I, I have always used neocolonial. And I, have, I talk of early neocolonialism and late neocolonialism, right? It squeezes on the shares of incomes in food supply, sort of chains for agriculture and the dismal levels and growth of labor compensation in South reflect a super exploitation using marinis you know, ages ago. Yeah, phrase that, uh, that, that, that he talked of. Okay, I think I have I've taken more time than you had allotted to me. So apologies, but I hope we, we, we have some discussion because lots of things, lots of material which are there. Yeah, I think I find uh, Amin's expression, a generalized monopoly, uh, you know, the current stage, uh, the, the sort of, it's, it's a state of generalized monopoly and uh, of, of uh, both production and finance in the global system that, that, that reflects it very well. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for your talk and also for staying in time uh, because this gives us almost an hour for discussion now. Um, that's really great um, because I think you have a lot more to expand in the discussion. Um, but before we go into talking among all of us, I think if there was such a dense so much uh, presentation with so much information, it's good to take two minutes to talk in couples um, so that you already organize your thoughts clarify what did you understand, did you not understand, and prepare your questions for the whole um, panel, right? Is that okay to go? So two minutes, I will um, check and speak to the, the person that's next to you. Okay. <laughs> this, this, Elisa, this supply chain literature, no? Uh, misses on, no, what can we call? I know. You know, who are the puppeteers behind the puppets? Okay, I know, I know. I know.
Wow, okay. <laughs> we take you and Diana and the two of you are for the next round. Thanks, and my apologies that I have to leave just now for another call. But uh, so very thanks for that. Um, I, think it's, I mean it's a lot of ground to cover in 40 minutes, so I know that there's a lot of complexities that uh, are built into this, but difficult to explain. Just one sort of maybe nuancing that I want to ask you about, which is the role of let's say a government like the Indian government. Over the last, including up till now, um, they've been playing this what it may be called a dual role of one is opposing, you know, free trade, WTO kind of stuff in terms of saying, well, unless the Europeans look at their subsidies in agriculture, we're not going to agree to X, Y, Z under in the agreements on agriculture. Uh, but on the other hand, within the country itself, they are of course promoting corporatization and whether it's Indian domestic companies or multinational corporations or often the population, including the, the three new laws that they tried to bring in and then of course they were forced to be yes. yes. So how do you look at that in a sort of a nuanced perspective compared to this yeah. relation to the GDS? Yes. Uh, are you able to take one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah, for me. Um, in my case, it's just how can we explain or how can we analyze within these global value systems the south-south uh, relationships? Because of course, we always make a huge analyze between the north and the south, but we can also find uh, unequal relations between the south-south. South, south. Yes. Okay. All right. So is that okay? All right. Now I think um, you know this. Um, the first aspect, Ash, is that you mentioned. It's. Uh, much more for posturing uh, to the world at large that look, I mean, you can't uh, uh, shove us aside. I mean, you know, we are, we are also, and then some small gains for sure. Yeah. Uh, so, for instance, uh, uh, they managed to uh, ensure that whatever is given as food subsidy and you know, that remains intact. It kind of, uh, uh, there was a very faulty way of trying to calculate what is the extent of food subsidy for India and then, you know, so, uh, and uh, why that cannot be increased. So, so at that level, yes, a small gain as well that India stuck to its ground and so on. But Mr. Modi, uh, 21 World Economic Forum, where he says that uh, opposing uh, globalization is as bad as terrorism. Right? So, I mean, it kind of equates both these, right? And if you look at actual policies, what has been done, both for domestic corporates and, and, and for international corporates and so on, as you know very well, I mean, it's been kind of a one-way traffic, yeah? A uh, lot of talk, a lot of posturing. Uh, so, for instance, self-reliance. Uh, what self-reliance are we talking about? If we just look at uh, the details and so on. So, I think uh, uh, that is how I would, uh, yeah, of course, in a one has to then get into a more careful kind of nuanced kind of uh, discussion and analysis of uh, what are the different aspects of that state business nexus um, with respect to the domestic corporates, big corporates in particular, you know, sort of uh, two of them have been talked about a great, great deal, Ambani and Adani which is a kind of terrible cronyism. And uh, I think in about a week, 10 days, this working paper should be out um, from Berlin School of Economics and Law, which uh, I have done with Meghana, which is looking at the state business nexus. Yeah, and uh, basically we say that this has been a period of accelerated primitive accumulation. Yeah, so that is our position on that. Uh, absolutely right, Diana. You know, sort of, you know, this global north and global south. Yeah, uh, as you know, this global south as an expression uh, came into being in 1950s. Yeah, and um, has been um, there, but not everyone 
I mean, you know, it, world is a complex entity, and then you know this this helps us in understand a few things, which to my mind are extremely important to understand contemporary capitalism or capitalism historically and so on. And hence, you know, this has a validity, usefulness, etc. But we have to get down to lower levels of generality, get into you know. So, for instance, what is China doing to Africa? What is India doing to Africa? Yeah. So there is a lot of discussion on that, and there are sort of uh, claims by both these governments that no, no, we are fantastic do-gooders. Yeah, we sort of will ensure that we take uh, Africa out of its poverty and so on and unemployment, etc. But there is a great deal of sort of uh, appropriation which is happening there. Yeah, uh, I did a paper for uh, FAO. Yeah, uh, sort of uh, which was a. A comparative study of China, Africa, and uh, um, sorry, China, India, and South Africa, and their presence in uh, sort of uh, Africa at large, right? So, sort of, there was a Chinese team, there was an Indian team, and there was a South African team. And uh, the Chinese said, "No, no, no, we are doing very well because basically it was the state position which had to be reflected, right?" South Africans said that we are doing fantastically good job, you know, in helping all these other countries. I was extremely critical of the Indian government, right? Now, since this was FAO, and FAO has to get clearance from the governments, incidentally. That is the discursive part that I'm talking about, yeah? Okay, this paper remained blocked for three years. They were not willing to publish something, you know, under their own sort of brand. Yeah. Uh, this has happened to me vis-a-vis -vis ILO and so on. You know, so let, let me not get into too many personal <laughs> details. But yes, there is that situation and uh, we need to be very uh, concerned about many of these things. Right? The most important thing is that each country, you know, I'm again using Samir, Samir means uh, uh, phrasing, that it is absolutely important to de-link. Now, de-link does not mean a torque, complete, yeah? but basically having policy space, right? And which is where we need to actually talk of lots of things that Aram and Ashish uh, keep raising in uh, uh, ways which go beyond what I have discussed right now. Yeah, I and mean, what kind of development? What does it mean to sort of, you know, uh, so there are lots of those issues, but you have to have the policy space to begin with, right? Now that policy space gets completely kind of destroyed yeah, in uh, many of these instances. Yes, I hope I have answered what you... Okay. Yes. We have already two more questions on the list. I also wanted to remind the online participants that they can make questions online and we will also read them out here. And I would put my own name on the list and I can put whoever is there. <laughs> also, um, so that you can start. I would like to understand better how um, such a system works. Like, um, is it like this that uh, several systems are interlinked through exploitation chains? What is one of these systems? Are they lo local systems that are connected globally? Or are these um, um, sectors? Um, or how could I imagine? Okay. Um, yes. Would you add to your question? Um, no, the problem with the professors is that they always speak too long. I'll, um, <laughs> so I'd like to just start with a remark on the, the, the post colonialism mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. I know no post colonial theorist would claim colonialism is a thing of the past and that's it precisely the opposite. So this is, no one would deny that there is such a thing as neo-colonialism among those post-colonial theorists. So um, I've actually two short questions. Um, one is, could you maybe expand on this labor, nature, wage arbitrage? Mm -hmm. And is it related or how far is it related to a mean and unequal exchange? Um, second is, I actually have two more questions if we have time later yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> But the second is, <laughs> um, talking about um, global exploitation chains, we see now in, in, the, in the chocolate sector two, 
two attempts to basically initiate reforms, and the one is this uh, this German uh, this German company Ferrofric, who, who um, relocated the production to Africa itself, mm -hmm. which means that a much much higher part of the value the value production takes place in Ghana itself. Yes. And the other is um, the Choc Pack initiative of Ghana and Cote d'Ivoire, who actually then tried, in analogy to OPEC, to form a commodity cartel <laughs> to control the prices and to basically pass on um, the extra the extra profits to the farmers. Hmm. In how far would you say are these promising initiatives, or in how far is it just a fig leaf, or does it not change a thing? Your take on it, I would be very interested. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so uh, your question was uh, system and the complex, you know, it is indeed an exceedingly complex system, but, you know, as the first step in terms of understanding it, I think it's extremely important to realize that, well, let me just give you one, one figure, this is Transnational Institute estimate and uh, two-year-old estimate, which I find very helpful, that, uh, who are economically the most powerful economic actors in the world. And if you want to identify, let's say, 100 most powerful economic actors in terms of revenues, yeah? I'm not even talking of their total turnover and so on and so forth. So for governments, the revenue is what they get as taxes, right? And uh, for uh, all these corporations, it is what their profit is and so on. Of the 100 top entities, 71 are corporations, 29 are countries. I mean, this is an amazing stat, right? So if you're talking of, let's say, a Walmart, yeah, some revenue being in several billions and so on, and Walmart's operation in Cambodia, right? Now, Cambodia's total GDP is a three billion, four billion, something like that, right? Where uh, many of these corporations who go and operate there, they actually are buying mountains, they're buying rivers, right? So it starts from there, but then that is where we have to get into the political economy of it in terms of the linkages between the state, the domestic players, right? What you would call a kind of a horizontal linkages between those who are powerful. Yeah, I mean, state, you, we have to have a theory of the state. Right? I find Milliband's theory much more uh, kind of convincing than any other theory that I have come across, Ralph Milliband and so on and so forth. Yeah. Uh, in terms of you know, states' own interest and having that necessary relative autonomy, et cetera, et cetera. But let me not get into these details. But surely, this is then not confined to any one sector. It gets spread across the economy. So if you look at, uh, let's say, <laughs> the name which has become very infamous in the Indian context, the Adanis, they're into everything. They sort of start uh, managing the airport, they start managing the coal fields, uh, iron mines, and uh, sort of just name it, everything, right? So that is very much in the nature of capital. Yeah, it kind of insists on expanding itself. I mean, that is how it survives and so on. So a spontaneous capitalism, and this phrase is due to Oscar Lange. Right? Uh, he was the first one. So basically he says that what Max is talking about, that abstract framework of capitalism that he's using in uh, capital is one of spontaneous capitalism where basically a whole lot of tendencies, imminent tendencies, the phrase that is used very frequently uh, by Max's scholars, yeah, which then connects capital into you know this accumulation dynamics in a way where the small will be eaten up it will spread from sector a to sector b to sector d i mean there is yeah uh, nationally globally and so on but all that then is an empirical issue we have to map that out how that is happening in india how that is happening elsewhere and so on so that is how that would be my first response to you uh, i don't know it has if it has answered your uh, yeah query but uh, if you have a uh, Follow-up question, please let me know. Uh, let me come to, uh, I think the discussion around that time, uh, late 60s, 70s, the Sunny Coal Exchange, 
that was not getting into these other issues which we are flagging. In fact, if uh, I may patent it, this phrase is due to me in Paris. Yeah, this is what we have called labor nature regulation arbitrage. What do I mean by regulation? Overall macroeconomic regime, right? And how that basically sort of leads to no regulation at all. Right? You come, do whatever you want to do. It's, it's, it's free for all, for capital and so on and so forth. Okay, right? how, do you, how do you measure it? How, where do you, how do you count it? No, we, 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 we can look at, you know, sort of, for instance, in terms of uh, what you can do vis-a-vis, -vis, let's say, a particular sector, right? Uh, in terms of uh, duties and taxes and so on and so forth, right? And what you can do and what you cannot do, right? How many clearances you need to take and so on and so forth. Let me give you an example. Some 15 years ago, I was in um, uh, in Washington at a conference, and you know, this friend, uh, a colleague, he 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 told me something which uh, struck uh, me very powerfully and has remained with me. He said that Mac Berger here has to go through 68 regulations. Uh, what kind of flour you can use? What kind of oil you can use? What kind of you know? So. Similarly, in Europe, I mean, sort of, lots of, right? Once you do away with your regulation, do whatever you want. You know, just uh, very recently we have done, um, uh, you know, that I, I didn't present any of that here. We didn't have time. So pesticides, uh, sort of seeds and lots of things. And uh, we have done a very, in fact, that is awaited as a working paper from our GPN for a year and a half. Right? So, you no, know, those field visits that we did and uh, between June and November and so on, that is exactly what we have tried to map there, you know, how that happens and so on. Okay. So, uh, Samir Amin and the others, you know, Gund uh, Andre Gunda Frank and so on, they were not really looking at these issues, right, around that time. Of course, the, in a systemic sense, they indeed are talking of uh, sort of unequal exchange and so on, but it was focused very much on a kind of, uh, you know, that Maxian model of, yeah, and that too, the very abstract capital-based kind of model of competitive capitalism with a focus on labor. Right? So that was the character of much of the discussion then, right? Uh, since I had the pleasure of knowing Samir I mean, uh, reasonably well, and he was kind of a mentor for our network called the Great and South Network, uh, we publish a journal, let me also advertise a little bit. Uh, it's called A Gradient South Journal of Political Economy. So please have a look at it. And if you want, you want to, you want to submit something, please do that. So Samir himself did say that, look, I mean, lots of these issues yeah, were by and large absent in our conversations till 70s. In particular, the issues of environment. Uh, we kind of actually neglected those. Right. So what is the nature of the macroeconomic regime in country A and country B? We, can, we will not have a perfectly uh, operational way of uh, mapping that, but a reasonably good way of doing that. Yeah. So you know, this is to answer, you know, how, how, how do we measure it and so on. I think we can make uh, significant, um, I think some of the recent work by the likes of Jason Moore, yeah, uh, who's more of an environment person, Jason Hickel, for instance. Uh, he's trying to do exactly this. He basically tells you that if you look at you know, what is happening in terms of uh, sort of um, uh, what he calls actually plunder, yeah, drain of wealth. He says that drain of wealth is very much evident and so on. And a lot to do with the kind of, uh, you know, exchange rate differences, yeah, and how that then impacts on... Yeah, so there's a debate there, and you may not like Jason uh, Hickel's kind of uh, take on that. But there is something to be said, uh, yeah, uh, in terms of engaging with that kind of uh, argument to measure, yeah, what are the different kinds of regimes, and what one regime can do in terms of, let's say, limiting that kind of outright drain. Yeah, countries like India have more or less given up. You know. Many, uh, many other countries across the world have given up yeah, in terms of having a decent regulation from the point of view of how businesses should operate, what they can do, what they cannot do, and so on, right? Uh, sort of, 
you mess up with your soil and water and everything you know there is uh, punjab in terms of productivity of uh, paddy and cotton oh, sorry not cotton but paddy and wheat yeah it is as high as anywhere in the world otherwise global south is far behind you know if you take the aggregate figures then productivity uh, wise it's way way behind global north you know, in in agriculture i'm saying yeah but uh, in some areas in punjab this particular province that i'm talking about is at par yeah at what cost you know there is a regular train which goes from punjab to a neighboring province rajasthan it is called cancer express and so the popular name of the train is cancer express why almost 6 out of 10 new borns now yeah are deformed i'm talking of districts like bhatinda and so on which have been the hub of the so called green revolution yeah that was state promoted complete deregulation that was state promoted green revolution right and the kind of dark spots it has and so on so forth so i think we can do quite a lot yeah it will not be a comprehensive kind of mapping yeah, for a variety of reasons Yeah, but uh, so for instance you know as i told you the masters of the world new masters of the world i would call equity funds the new masters of the world now right we don't know reasonably enough about them yeah the kind of uh, what they are doing and so on so, forth. so we can't even identify or we can't even map that then you know, how much can we so there are these challenges but my sense is that we can do Uh, 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 a reasonable bit so that was um, on that um, so neglecting nature neglecting overall macroeconomic policy regimes you know from the point of view of effective regulation that is the point i'm making and uh, labor again i mean sort of india has a very low minimum wage official minimum wage and so on as per government's own estimate from 85% of the work- workers don't get minimum wage so you have something on paper but not getting implemented so i mean there are these implicit and explicit kinds of uh, regulatory uh, issues which 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 we need to again bring into the conversation that uh, we are talking about yeah Uh, labor arbitrage as i said everyone knows very well i mean if you look at uh, when i uh, sort of did some work in this area early on i think around 2005 6 yeah at that point in time uh, for standard manufacturing sort of job uh, the difference between the per hour wage or what you call the manufacturing wage between china and the us was approximately 64 times okay yeah so in the manufacturing sector what average wage would be for a day or for an hour you know doesn't matter whichever way you calculate it yeah? yeah but as long as you keep the denominator the same you will get this 64 times so that that's why this whole steven roach kind of literature became very famous uh, roach wrote this in 1986 global labor arbitrage right this is something which also became very fashionable amongst the marxist thinkers and so on right so many of them you know monthly review school for instance they are still stuck in you know not all of them but many of them yeah uh, in tan suwandi for instance yeah so if you look at her work and she is basically talking about this whole labor differences this is where we thought that they are stuck in a kind of a trap no labor arbitrage is in, indeed a very important factor but there is so much happening outside that in terms of regulation yeah in terms of uh, you know uh, how you treat your nature as i said uh, everything disappears from uh, global north which is supposed to be polluting bang in the south right so yeah a world bank paper which as it happens was leaked at some point okay it said that opportunity cost of life in the south is very low so shift everything to the south 
He happened to be the president of Harvard. Okay, so maybe my question connects to this a little bit, and I think we still have time for question and comment. You're also going to make a question. That's good. Ah, sorry, sorry, sorry. I, I haven't, I haven't answered. No, 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 no. Very, very sorry, very sorry. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, as you said, uh, that this, you know, problem of being a professor is that you talk too much. So I, I actually <laughs> spent too much time on uh, the first question. No, uh, Zifat uh, uh, and um, Dodji, they have done excellent work on this, exactly this thing, and uh, at uh, both these countries, uh, Ivory Coast and Ghana and. Uh, and in fact, if I was presenting something three days ago in Geneva, so they think that these are yeah, sort of uh, very positive um, steps. Uh, I'm, I'm skeptical. Yeah, you can have some of these things, because, but these are really very much on the margin. Yes, some good practices, some good German capital or good whatever capital and so on. Capital is never good, yeah, from my point of view. So, you know, there is that it, with certain kinds of pressures, they start behaving in a slightly better way and more civilized and so on. But uh, intrinsically, there's nothing good about it, yeah. Uh, so that would be my answer. But let's wait and see, I mean, what, what it does uh, in terms of... Uh, so if you look at, yeah, let's say... Uh, the macro story, yeah? I mean, what is the farmer getting there, right? Of $1, six cents, right? You don't take into account your fertility of land, you don't take into account human capital, the experiences of the farmers and so on, for accumulated experiences for centuries, yeah? And uh, I, I think we also need to take that into account, along with this, that okay, here is possibly a promise, yeah, but Galton's book, I don't know if you have read that. Structure theory of imperialism. No, 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 I'm, I'm, I'm talking of this novel called Promise. Yeah, this was uh, awarded Booker two, two, three years ago. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's a heart, heart-rending story of uh, how a promise never materializes. <laughs> it's it's uh, uh, in South Africa. Yeah, that this whole capitalism yes, yes. and so Yes. But before you go into talking to each other, um, I, I would also make my questions. We have one more comment. Um, and mine is a very theoretical question. Mm -hmm. So you might also expand on that, and that would be great. Um, but I try to expand very quickly. Uh, my question is uh, about the role of social movements and, like, the points how to address the system as a movement. Because um, I remember from Wallerstein, we have this idea that there are some anti-systemic movements, and we all have this idea that there could be one big movement and it could overturn the system and we would create a new system. But this is not what, what the current situation is. And I, um, it doesn't matter how one names things. And so I always like this picture of the network because that is possible to like wherever one is to address it somehow without having to knowing about the whole totality, but without having to um, overturn the whole system on the next day, but also look, seeing social movements as something decentralized. So I wonder how you conceptualize within your notion of the system, the, um, the social movements and their perspectives. Um, and the second question I have is, you talk a lot about the regulation of business and capital. And I wonder um, whether you could also say something with how you think about the regulation and the situation of the labor force. Because of course, it, it, is, not, it is not homogeneous and it is not, um, not um, ahistorical, but the question under which conditions people have to accept, how urgently they need to work, what the alternatives are for work. They are, of course, also inequality, inequality distributed in the world, and we also have intersectional uh, dimensions to explain that. So I wondered whether you could maybe tell a little bit about, for example, migration or racism and how this also shapes um, shapes global capitalism or the system you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was my question. All <laughs> so, right. um, yeah, we have one more, but um, if you want Okay, if you want to, uh, okay, yeah, okay, okay. Um, yes. Yeah. All right, yeah, sort of. Now, if you think of, um, 
let's say, you know, well, firstly, I, mean, I, I actually have given it a lot of thought why, why we want to use system or systems, global systems and so on. See, network still remains something which you can, you know, possibly map and identify and the different nodes of that network, etc. There's so much which happens beyond those nodes. Uh, sort of the way we, the role of the state, role of, you know, this instrumental part, this discursive part, all kinds of things that we are talking about. So that is, and that's why we insist on, uh, I mean, sort of, you know, I have no problems whatsoever with anyone using any particular phrase, but in the way we think, uh, you know, uh, we feel that there's some serious limitations of, uh, yeah. So I, I told you that I used global production network for a while, some 10 decade, I mean, 10 years ago. And uh, then I thought that maybe it's, it's, it's not uh, helping my own understanding, et cetera, et cetera. So, but that's, as I said, so if you want to use value network, that is certainly preferable to production network. Right? As, I, as I mentioned, you know, all these hedge funds, uh, equity capital. I mean, you know, the, in the medical uh, or the health sector in the US in the last 10 years, equity capital has increased by 25 times. Now, this uh, I learned three days ago. I mean, just a frightening thing. Whatever health system you had, everything is being captured, et cetera, et cetera. Nobody knows I mean, who these uh, sort of uh, uh, particular equity funds are they because they're not being regulated. They're not supposed to declare things and so on and so forth. Unlike, for instance, Korea, where they insist in the health, center, health sector that if any equity fund is entering it, you have to disclose and so on. So there are these issues. And so, as I said, I mean, we have uh, written quite a lot on these things. So, uh, and our preference, but yeah, I'm happy with, uh, I'm after all, Emmanuel Wallerstein is a very respected Marxist. Yeah, commodity chains, um, sort of, yeah. So I, whoever wants to use whatever, but I find that this chain kind of metaphor is insipid, passive, if not, seriously inadequate. Yeah, so that's how I, I said, it basically is looking at some aspects of business relations and so on and so forth. There's so much which is happening behind doors. Yeah, so that's why the systems approach and so on. Social movements, and uh, of course, you see, this is not an area in which I have uh, done theoretical kind of, I mean, I've you know, kind of looked at a lot of literature, but, uh, I would not say that uh, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a serious student of yeah, uh, that domain. So, uh, but having said that, so, um, you know, sort of um, some 1950s uh, famous literary figure said in India that uh, India is a country of million mutinies. So he talked of all these different movements, some movement in my village, some movement in some other village and so on. And when I came across that statement, I added, but they never come together. So they remain disconnected, fragmented. Yeah, that is how I, when I look at the global story, that seems, but again, one can't be sort of either dismissive of it or one has to. In, in, in Mexico, for instance, in your country and what, what uh, they have uh, achieved, the Chiapas and so on and so forth. Yeah, I think sounds impressive. Okay, uh, David Batkin, who has written quite a lot on that movement, uh, tells you that, look, here is a movement which, is, which has so much promise. Yeah, so there is, uh, in terms of appreciating these things, there are all kinds of views and uh, so on. Uh, I do think that we need to think in terms of very different kinds of political processes. Yeah, and uh, my take is that, uh, yeah, a kind of, uh, you know, uh, what was the spirit of let's say Lenin's perspective, yeah, uh, remains from my point of view in terms of the spirit of it, yeah, how it got abused and Lenin himself had said that 
uh, there's a real danger that party gets displaced by a handful and then the handful gets displaced by one character. In fact, he, in 1922, he had said it in so many words about Stalin that a snake in the sleeve. He was so kind of uh, worried about what he might. So, you know, this is, as I said, a very large complex area again on which I have not done uh, a lot of uh, work and etc. But in, I, I'll stop with that. In uh, uh, 1980, if you look at registered NGOs in India, which were also many of them are calling themselves social movement, uh, was approximately 1,200 registered because you also get some money from outside. Yeah, that was the reason behind. You know, so for foreign exchange, whatever some, yeah. Uh, some organization called Priya estimated the number of these NGOs early 2000s. I forget the exact year, around 2010 or so. And the number was 700,000 from 1200 to 700,000, which was more than the total number of Indian villages. So in many villages, you had more than one NGO or more, you know, social movement. Yeah. I actually call it micro-imperialism. Right. So the kind of thing which was happening in my country. Yeah. So, and I can see the kind of uh, problems that it has. But again, there are lots of very good movements which need to come together because what else do we do? You know, political processes which are taking root and so on and you have to connect with that. I, I can't, if I decide to stand for election, I'll get uh, maybe not even my family's vote, <laughs> right? I mean, that, 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 that's, a, you see, um, democracy. <laughs> I, I, I wouldn't say that, but, but there, there, there is a problem. There, 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 there is a serious problem there. Right. Um, yeah. So I, I don't know if I managed to answer your question, <laughs> but uh, yes. Uh, and in terms of labor force, yeah, the last last thing again. You know, sort of capitalism always uses labor as per its requirements and so on. Yeah. And uh, so all those who got uh, sort of expelled from the circuit of capital in UK and then Europe. Where do they end up? That's one of the most powerful waves of human mobility ever. Most European scholars call it migration. It was not migration. It was stark and naked plunder of an entire continent, North America and South America, right? I mean, you settle into someone's house and you say that I'm a migrant. I mean, how weird can we get in terms of the politics of language and language of politics, right? So this was straightforward, you know, appropriation, right? It still gets described as the second most powerful wave around the same time, yeah? Which was central to building of capitalism, was all these Chinese and Indian workers in the plantations, right? All those very well-known plantations about which we have read and we discussed quite a lot and so on, right? You just, yeah, they were not sort of exactly, yeah, uh, sort of slave labor, but pretty much semi-slave labor, yeah? Indentured, bonded, and so on and so forth. And then you had yet another, I mean, so you settle in North America and what do you do? As soon as you have the land, you don't want to work. So where do you get your workers from? Africa. Entire Western African coast is completely denuded of, to begin with, able adult males to start with. And then the entire families, right? That is what I was referring to, this transatlantic kind of global value system. 
yeah, and what kind of implications that it has. These are the three most powerful, you know, sort of uh, in terms of numbers, etc. Mobility waves. So yes, I mean, it is so central to the building of colonialism, right? What happens today? Uh, Juan Martinez Alia sort of has a very nice phrase for it. Fortress Europe, right? You, uh, sort of uh, previous generations could go anywhere that they wanted to go, but nobody can come here. They can keep dying in the Mediterranean, right? So yes, this whole thing, this whole neoliberal globalization, whose mobility has been impacted massively? Labor's mobility. You don't want them, right? Within India, one state doesn't want workers from other states. There are questions of race, questions of caste, you know, all these things become that. That is where I think empirically grounded kind of, uh, you know, um, analysis and understanding on all these issues. Yeah, there's a lot of literature on these, but then, I mean, of course, in your 40 minutes, uh, I could have raised only four points, right? <laughs> Yes. Okay, um, we have one more comment. I think we could go for another one, um, but uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, but then uh, we are almost also yeah. um, at the end of time. Depends how much you still want to go on discussing. But maybe let's take these two together and already uh, see if we approach the end of the session. If there is nothing from the internet or anybody else. Don't have anyone on the net. Huh? Okay. Go ahead. Uh, uh, rentier economies, which which primarily uh, accumulate uh, the their their uh, income through through external rents, specifically the extractive sectors in Latin America and the yes. Maghreb region, the petrodollar sectors, uh, petro uh, economies, they do not uh, 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 intensively integrate their their. Uh, domestic productive uh, forces like uh, the, the agricultural supply chains and the manufacturing supply chains. So in that regard, but that still creates a lot of uh, economic and socioeconomic inequalities. So in that regard, where the uh, uh, domestic labor force is not as intensively integrated as the agriculture and the, and the, and the uh, 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 manufacturing supply chains like the range of economies, will your global value system framework still be used in this regard to explain the, the uh, global uh, north-south uh, process of value appropriation? Okay, yes. Uh -huh. Yes, go ahead, yeah. I mean, we can, yeah, it's best that. Yeah. Um, one, one was just a minor point. Um, I, I share your diagnosis almost 100%. I'm a bit uneasy about the heavy focus you put on these north-south asymmetries. Um, because in fact, if you have inciting land grabbing as one major element of this, and who are the major players? Often from India, from Saudi Arabia, from China. So I think it's become more complicated than this. And I think we need to, um, we need to take this into account, not to play the game of Mr. Modi and others who will then decry the it's it's all the North, it's all the World Bank, it's all the IMF, and we are the good guys. Hmm. Um, second point, small follow-up to actually to, to what, what Lisa was saying. And this now refers to the the conception of capitalism that we have and the idea of political alternatives, basically. And and here um, I think, well, well, if I understood you correctly, so your idea was, well, actually, we have to get back to Lenin. And so, but this would then be, you know, the old revolutionary idea of um, state socialism, global workers' revolution, um, which <laughs> does not sufficiently, I mean, I'm, this is not, I don't mean to be that. That, that offensive, but uh, but but I think we if we if we talk about this, we have to deal with the experiences that we have made, and the experiences with state socialism are abysmal in terms of human rights, etc. And for me, this is not the lesson: our oh, socialism doesn't work, but it is the lesson: power corrupts. And so I think this was not what what Lenin anticipated very cleverly, very wisely, 
was was not something that we can act, that we can shrug off and say, oh yeah, yeah, Stalin was a bad guy. But apart from Stalin, it would have worked. No, we have dozens of other socialist countries where it was exactly the same. And this then begs the question, okay, should we then not be looking for alternatives which look not for a centralization of power and then we make everything fine, everything just, everything socialist, but the decentralization of power in terms of local, local autonomy. And then we are again with the, the alternatives and the conception of capitalism. And I'm, um, I, was, I was impressed by Gibson Graham, these feminist Marxists, arguing, okay, but if we conceive of capitalism as a totality, as a unity, as a global system, which then it can only be toppled by a global revolution. And then we need to build up the workers' party, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But if we conceive of it as a network, as a decentered system, as a system, but as as a decentered um, phenomenon, which can be fought in each of these nodes of the network, then we are actually dealing with a more manageable task. Then building socialism becomes less less impossible than, than <clears throat> the other conception. And then we can actually look at non-capitalist practices yes. which can be expanded. Right. Okay. Uh, incidentally, all, all your reflections, questions have been very good. And <laughs> coming to the close of it, of course, very profound issues have been raised by Yara. Listen, uh, first, Pujan, uh, uh, you know, this, uh, no, this Stantia capitalism, it, this so-called extractive capitalism, yeah, which you find all over the world, right, is very well integrated into yeah, the logic of the you know, larger global value system. And so, so to that extent, I would not really, I mean, there are its own specificities, right, but then this is, again, very much well, similar kinds of issues and principles, etc., can be uh, analyzed there and so on. And uh, so that would be my very brief answer. But, uh, you know, uh, we can talk about it in more detail, one-to-one, -one, right? Okay. Um, on um, North-South, I mean, as I, as I said, I, I completely agree with you that that is the starting point. But at that level, you get certain mileage, right? I mean, if you look at the 20 top uh, countries, uh, uh, you know, if, if I have the, if, uh, I don't know if I have the number immediately, but uh, yeah, I had uh, done this exercise, um, sort of, some of your own work actually, uh, okay, let me not look for the number. Basically, the top 20 and the bottom 20 per capita incomes, right? Between 1960 and the current, that gap has increased by 132 times. I mean, this just sounds bizarre kind of number. Yeah, uh, constant uh, uh, sort of uh, US dollar and so on. So, on. so there are many ways of comparing it, etc. And it does provide uh, a lot of uh, uh, useful ways of yeah how to, as, as the first step, as the second step, how do we think of contemporary uh, sort of global economic system and so on. Uh, of course, but simultaneously we talk of the emerging parts, we talk of uh, soon India becoming in terms of uh, its uh, gross GDP, air purchasing power, China has already kind of gone beyond US and so on. But uh, uh, so there is that narrative as well. Yeah? So it's not the case that uh, countries in the so-called developing world. Yeah. And uh, so we have to then analyze each one of these, who's doing what and so on and so forth, number one. Number two, we really have to also see what these countries are doing to those who are in a less fortunate situation. Yeah. So in Africa, what China and India, as I said, that FAO paper that uh, was blocked for a while. Yeah. Uh, and then they said that, okay, can we make some changes? And I said, okay, I, I don't put me as the author. Just say that I had done research for you. Yeah. On, on that uh, condition. Yes. So this north-south kind of binary thing is at best a starting point. Uh, 
uh, within that, then we have to look at uh, all this in a much more nuanced manner and so on and so forth, right? Some people actually these days use East and West, right? But I mean, after all, there's a history of the South and in a particular, yeah. Okay. Uh, on the other thing, which uh, is indeed possibly far more profound, yeah, 1923, there was a conference in London. Sort of uh, the theme of the conference was, uh, what do we mean by socialism? In that, 263 scholarly definitions of socialism were provided. I'm talking of you know, that time. Yeah, if you look at all the debates, yeah, from that, I mean, you know, from Marx's time, yeah, sort of this whole thing about can Russia actually, you know, uh, where are the writes a letter to Marx and says that can we skip this horrible thing called capitalism become socialism and so on. Yeah, why not? Because we have this institution called Mir and et cetera, et cetera. So this whole discussion between revolutionary socialism and evolutionary socialism. Right? Dominic Mario Nuti in 1984 tells you that actually Scandinavia is truly socialist. Right? He tells us that this is in fact the Rolls Royce of socialism Vietnam is bicycle of socialism. Right? So we have all these debate, debates within the Marxist uh, kind of, you know, Lenin always thought of, I mean, when he talked of democratic centralism, right? You know, in many of his small, small writings, he says that it has to show the power of uh, what, uh, uh, you know, what, what should be the bottom up kind of approach and so on. So I think. Uh, uh, we, we, we can, I mean, I can cite many other authors on, on, on these, but how to move forward in that, the principle of decentralization has to be very important. The kind of connect between the local and the global, etc. So within a particular country where, where we are thinking about some progressive transformation, etc. And this again, the other question, Trotsky versus uh, others, you know, can there be socialism in one country at all? Especially when you are surrounded by all the enemies and so on and so forth. Yeah, so I don't think anyone has sort of definitive answer to any of these questions. We'll see how it unfolds and what the practice is and so on and so forth. But I take all these concerns as being absolutely central to my work. Yeah, so I would never say that uh, we have uh, and this kind of answer, which uh, we, we, so when I talk of Lenin, it is not, uh, I mean, Lenin, I read very differently. Lenin was the first one who actually talks of peasant worker alliance, right? Lenin actually draws from Marx in very profound ways on this particular question. You see, so I think we probably need to engage with, yeah, that theoretical tradition a lot more. Yeah, if you want to be serious about it. If you want to be dismissive, so be it. That would be my call on that. Yeah. Maybe that's a good way, <laughs> a last final round of words. And of course, I also want to highlight, I mean, we're talking about very big issues. We talk about how to best analyze the global capitalism and also how to address it. It would be very strange if we had one opinion about that in this discussion. <laughs> so I think this is very good that we're having this discussion. I also want to remind we're continuously having it within the Global Partnership Network and the Global Labour University. And it's just really great to see we're going to go on with different people and different constellations, but we are part of one big debate there. So thank you for your attention today and see you in other circumstances. Okay. Thank, you. thank you very much to the organizing team and to all of you for being part of this conversation. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>